Yo, 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 we are back with another video. We got Pistol Pete. How good was Pistol Pete? Really, actually, however it goes. But that's what we're going to react to today. I think this is kind of like a documentary. Doc, you know what I'm trying to say. It's one of those. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I'm just kind of paying homage to, you know, some of the greats that played, you know, before all this nonsense started going on. But, uh, let me know. Give me an old school legendary player y'all would like to see me react to. So this is how good was Pistol Pete actually? And let's see, man. Let's see. Pete was one of the best NBA players of the 70s, a dribbling magician, outstanding shooter, and arguably the greatest NCAA player ever. Pete was playing a brand of basketball 40 years ahead of his time. And players today can't even do some of the stuff the Pistol did in the 70s. Here's the career That's... retrospective of Pete Maravich and how his showmanship influenced future NBA stars who stole a lot of their moves from the Pistol. Hey! Early life and the origin of the Pistol. Pete Maravich was born in 1947 and basketball was in his blood. His father, Press, was a professional player for two years in the NBL and BAA, two leagues that merged and became the NBA in 1949. Press then started coaching, and because of his job, the Maravich family had to move a lot. The only constant for Press and his son Pete was basketball, which was a dish served for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. While Pete was uh -huh. only an infant, he already started dribbling, and by the age of seven, he started playing organized basketball. When Press Maravich coached... Start early. Start hooping early. You can be a late bloomer, too. We, we know that, but... Start early. At Clemson University, he would always bring Pete to practices and games, and the two would always talk about basketball in some shape or form. Pete would dribble the basketball on his way to school while he rode on a bike and even slept with the ball. At the age of... Y'all not doing that. Y'all not working like that. Keep it real. Y'all working on your game like that? <laughs> they talk a lot about the old school players, but... They was dedicated. 12. He was practicing up to 10 hours a day. His father taught him the fundamentals, but Pete loved basketball so much that he started improvising and countless hours in the gym all alone gave birth to some of the most spectacular moves the NBA has ever seen. But more on that later. As a freshman, Pete started playing for Daniels High School in Clemson at the age of 14. But he barely played on a team filled with seniors. And even when Pete would come into the game, the older guys avoided passing him the ball. The crowd also they was hating. <laughs> they was hating. So laughed when they saw the small, skinny 14-year-old on the floor, which pissed the hell out of Pete. However, one single shot changed everything. Pete's team was down by one in the last seconds. Because he hardly ever had the ball, the opponents never guarded Maravich. So the Daniels coach decided to pass the ball to Pete. He got the open shot and made the game winner. And it was then that he received the nickname Pistol Pete. It was given to him by a reporter who noticed that when Pete shot towards the basket, it looked like he was pulling out a gun. The nickname mm. remains, and the legend of the Pistol Pete was born. NCAA GOAT. After graduating from high school, Pete and his father... Who's a better college player? Pistol, Larry Bird, or Kareem? Let's see what y'all knowledge like decided that Pete should go to prep school for another year. Pete was six foot three at the time, but he weighed just over 130 pounds and could not withstand six three, 130 pounds. It's not great. Physical duels at the college level. So he spent a year at the Edwards Military Academy, where he grew to six foot five and bulked up to a respectable 160 pounds, which improved his game Jeez. tremendously. At the same time, his father Press got the head coaching job at Louisiana State, which was known for football, but had a minuscule basketball program. Press asked Pete to attend LSU and join him, which Pete bluntly rejected because he wanted to play for a renowned basketball college. However, after Press threatened to kick him out of the house, Press decided to join his father at LSU. Under his father's tutelage, Man, what was Pops? <laughs> what was Pops home, man? <laughs> oh, snaps. Pops, you was going to kick him out? <laughs> I ain't mad at you, man. 
Pete became a superstar and would set records that will likely never get broken. In his freshman year, he averaged 43.6 points per game. But because oh. of the rules in the 70s, freshmen were not allowed to play on the varsity team. The crowd at LSU would often watch the freshman games and then leave once Pete's game was done and wasn't even interested in watching the varsity team. Pete led the freshmen to a 17-1 record that season, while the varsity team, led by Press, had a record of 3-23. In his oh sophomore my. year, Pete was able to play for the varsity team and immediately asserted himself as the primary option on offense, oh with 43.8 points on average. He was the oh. NCAA's top scorer that season, and he repeated that feat as a junior with 44.2 points. Oh. And as a senior, with 44.5 points per game, along with two National College Player of the Year awards. In the three years he spent on the varsity team, Pistol Pete scored 3,667 points in 83 games, averaging an That's incredible 44.2 points per game. He owns almost every... Yo. There's no... you Look, look, there's no three-point line. Pete. Pete was damn near averaging 50 with no three-point line. The NCAA scoring record to this day. And what's even more impressive is that he broke all those records in the era without the three-point shot. Former LSU coach Dale Brown charted every shot Maravich scored. And because he shot many jumpers from long distances, mm. Brown calculated that Pete would have averaged an astounding 57 points per game. Oh. His long jumpers counted as threes. A globetrotter in the NBA. This Wrong with you. Pete was the most known player in the country by the time he finished college, and he had plenty of options where to continue his career. He was contacted by half the ABA teams, many NBA teams, but also the Harlem Globetrotters, who offered Maravich $1 million to join them. Maravich dribbled the ball like a Globetrotter. He shot the ball better than all of them, and he knew every basketball trick in the book. Between the mm. legs, behind the back, dribbling two balls at the same time, you name it. Pistol Pete was doing it. If he had joined the Globetrotters, he would have been the first white member, but he'd fit right in because of a unique skill set. However, his dream was to play in the NBA like his dad, and the Pistol was selected with the third pick by the Atlanta Hawks in the stacked 1970 NBA draft. In the rookie season, Maravich was under tremendous pressure after signing a contract worth nearly $2 million for five seasons. At the time, the largest contract in NBA history. However, Crazy. he immediately proved that he is one of the best players in the world and that his big contract is justified. Maravich averaged 23.2 points and 4.4 assists per game as a rookie, which was the eighth best scoring uh. output that season. The second season was supposed to confirm Pistol's superstar status, but he contracted mononucleosis, which caused him to lose 20 pounds. As a result, Pete missed 16 games, and the illness slowed him down to 19.3 points per game. But Pistol Pete would bounce back in his third season, averaging 26 points and 7 uh. assists per game making his first all-star team. In his fourth and final season with the Hawks, he was the second best scorer in the league with 27.7 points per game. Oh. But the Hawks played miserably and didn't even make the playoffs after three straight first round playoff exits. We got the Jazz. New Orleans Jazz joined the NBA in 1974, and in the expansion draft, they acquired Maravich from the Hawks for two players and four draft picks. By doing so, they signed the local hero, considering that the Jazz Arena was less than 100 miles away from LSU. Joining a newly established franchise is a double-edged sword, and Pete learned that the hard way. Yes, he was a beloved superstar, and all the fans wanted to see him play, but on the flip mm. side, the New Orleans Jazz wasn't any good, just like most new teams aren't. The Jazz didn't make the playoffs until 1984, five seasons after Maravich left the team and their relocation to Utah. But even though he never made the playoffs, Pistol Pete was playing the basketball of his life with the Jazz as one of the most unstoppable players in the league. He averaged 25.2 points and 5.6 assists in five and a half seasons with the franchise, during which he led the NBA in scoring with 31 points per game in 1977, oh. along with three All-Star appearances oh, no. and three All-NBA nods. On February 5th, 1977, in a game against the New York Knicks, the Pistol scored 68 points, a career high. And at the time, the most points ever by a guard. The feat is even more impressive when we know that he was guarded by Walt Frazier, one of the premier defensive guards of the 70s, and that he Walt. I had no idea he did that to Walt Frazier. Walt, can you guard? Yo, Pistol Pete was... was...
Man, it's still underrated, I feel like, to this day. Don't get enough credit. Scored 68 without a three-pointer. In 1978, Maravich played the best all-around season of his career, averaging 27 points, 6.7 assists, and a mm. career-high two steals per game. He would have probably led the league in scoring once again, and likely even pushed the Jazz to the playoffs, but he unfortunately injured his knee halfway through the season and was forced to miss the final 32 games of the season. Before he got hurt, the Jazz had a winning record due to a 10-game win streak. After Maravich went down, they lost eight in a row, and their playoff hopes were shot dead. Unfortunately oh for Maravich God. and the Jazz fans, knee injuries plagued Pete for the rest of his career, as he only played two more years in the NBA. After the Jazz moved to Salt Lake City in 1979, they traded Maravich mid-season to the Celtics, where he teamed yeah. up with rookie Larry Bird. It was the yeah. first NBA season with a three-point line, and Maravich immediately proved what kind of a shooter he was. The pistol shot 67% for three in his final year, with bad knees that severely hampered his movement. Legacy. Pistol Pete was a basketball savant, and he played basketball 30 or 40 years ahead of his time. At the time of his retirement, Thanks. he had by far the best handles in NBA history, and many of the greatest ball handlers took many pages out of oh. Pete's ball handling book. He was a trendsetter that inspired generations. And if your favorite ball handler didn't learn from the pistol, they likely mm. stole some moves from someone who stole from Pete. That LaMelo ball underhand right. full-court pass, Maravich did that in the 70s. Oh. Magic Johnson's around-the-back defender freeze and then pass, Maravich did that too. Hook shot like Kareem, <laughs> turnaround oh. jumper like MJ, or readjusting his jump shot midair like Larry Bird, it was all routinely done by the pistol. When he played the game, the NBA was dominated by centers like Wilt Chamberlain and Kareem. Guards like him were unicorns. Other than Thanks. Jerry West, nobody else attempted that many jump shots, let alone made them with great accuracy. With an Thanks. unbelievable floater and layup game, finishing with both hands, killer handles, and the ability to both score and pass, Pistol Pete is most often compared to Steve Nash, a guy who came to the NBA 16 years after Maravich retired. If he played in a three-point area, Crazy, he man. would likely average around 30 points per game. And if he played in a better Easy. team, he could have easily been an MVP multiple times and won a few championships. However, Pete didn't have the best of luck in his career in life. I don't really like that. You feel me? Like, we don't do that with other players that ain't won. You know what I'm saying? He didn't win, and that's cool. He's still great. But don't be, oh, if he would have. Like, he didn't. You feel me? But still great. In one interview in 1974, Pete said, I don't want to play in the NBA for 10 years and then die of a heart attack at 40. But unfortunately, that's precisely what happened. His NBA career was cut short after 10 years due to knee injuries. And in nine of 10 seasons, his teams had a losing record. And then in 1988, almost like he predicted it, he died of a heart attack at the age of 40 when he was playing pickup basketball. Crazy. An autopsy revealed the cause of death to be Insane. a rare heart defect. He had been born with a missing left coronary artery. He lived for basketball, was a gym rat all his life, and ultimately, died on the court. His last words were, I feel great. Sheesh, man. There it is, man. Pistol Pete. Pistol Pete. The great Pistol Pete, man. Super underrated. Definitely changed the game. Changed the NBA. Does not get enough credit. I don't know what guard has not watched Pistol Pete. Or like he said, somebody that you watch have taken a lot of things from Pistol Pete. You feel me? So shout out to Pistol Pete, man. Y'all drop in the comments what legendary player y'all want to see me react to next. Um, you know, we're going to keep this going for a little minute. But, yeah, man, I just want to pay homage to a couple of these guys that, you know, definitely do not get the credit that they deserve. Pistol Pete was an icon. He was way before his time. Crazy handles could pass. Was the first, like, scoring, scoring guard. Shout out to Pistol Pete, man. Y'all like, comment, subscribe. Y'all know what time it is. Again, let me know what y'all want to see next.